And welcome to this edition of Skywatch Alaska. I'm meteorologist Joe Bartosik. I'm fortunate to be joined by Mr. Robert Steenberg, a lead forecaster with the Space Weather Prediction Center uh, as part of NOAA's National Weather Service. Uh, we are expecting a uh, strong to severe uh, geomagnetic storm tonight on April 23rd into the 24th. Uh, KP index is pretty high, very high, I would say, at a seven. And again, high plus auroral activity is auroral activity is being observed across uh, much of eastern Canada right now and on in through uh, the Scandinavian countries. And it is moving in our direction here and probably just in time for after sunset and uh, even around probably midnight, we'll be able, and a couple hours past, we'll probably be able to see uh, again that beautiful auroral display as strong Arctic high pressure is in control of our skies. That means clear skies, but yes, it's going to be cold, so definitely uh, bundle up. All right, again, I'm joined by Robert. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here in Anchorage, Alaska, and the great 907, as we like to say. And can you give us a uh, just basically a brief synopsis of what is going on currently and what we can uh, first anticipate in terms of aurora activity? We'll get to some of the other stuff here in a second. Okay, sounds good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what we're experiencing right now uh, as Joe said, is a uh, strong to severe geomagnetic storm. Uh, we are just on the verge of um, hitting the strong levels again. Uh, each three hours, the uh, number resets itself, the particular index. But uh, we expect the storming to continue through the night uh, at least out till um, 0600 universal time. Uh, with the uh, potential for some really nice aurora um, throughout the evening. And Robert, whenever we talk about, so besides the aurora, which of course is, is always great, great to see, uh, we know that with uh, some of these very intense geomagnetic storms, all of the electrons and everything else that gets spread out uh, from the sun uh, all uh, have an impact on telecommunication systems, right? So basically, whenever we talk about a G4, which is what we're at right now, I believe, uh, what type of other impacts to you know basic human interactions, especially in this electronic age, what can we expect with that level of intensity storm? Okay, with that level of intensity, um, power grid operators, for instance, may notice fluctuations uh, on their systems. And they, in turn, will take precautions uh, to keep the grid stable. Uh, people who rely on global positioning systems or global navigation satellite services, GNSS, uh, may experience difficulties with positioning and navigation, particularly in the auroral zones. Additionally, people who rely on high frequency radio communication from three to 30 megahertz uh, will experience uh, noisy band conditions and, and disruptions in particular, again, uh, where the aurora is happening. So those are a few examples of things that can happen during these storms. And in addition to being near that 11 year solar maximum, you have a great view of the sun right over your right hand shoulder. And it was just within the past month when we had this most recent uh, spectacular auroral display uh, going all the way down into, I believe even northern parts of Mexico. So much of the lower 48 if uh, had, had some opportunities to see some beautiful aurora. And that's because of these, uh, I wanna say, was it craters that you're describing on the sun now? Well, you know, I can see some big black spots that are much more um, larger than your typical sunspots. Okay, so those, those big black regions you see on this particular type of image, uh, those are called uh, coronal holes, and then other dark regions are called filaments. And uh, those, the coronal holes, will cause minor geomagnetic storms. What we're experiencing right now is due to the eruption of one of those filaments. And you can imagine a filament as a giant slinky-like structure stretched across the sun. That's a uh, a big magnetic field with plasma held aloft. And sometimes these slinkies will peel off the sun and head out into interplanetary space towards Earth. 
And that's what happened in this case. We had a filament eruption back on the 21st, and uh, it carries that big magnetic cloud with it uh, to Earth. And when it starts to interact with Earth's magnetic field, that's when the excitement begins. And so, Robert, um, when do you guys start gearing up for something like this? As soon as that, you know, as soon as the bells and whistle go off for that type of um, eruption, if you will? Yes, absolutely. We'll see that eruption in another type of imagery that I don't have behind me uh, called a coronagraph. And the coronagraph just creates an artificial eclipse of the sun. So we can see the outer atmosphere of the corona. And we'll watch as a cloud of plasma blows out and expands. And that is called a halo CME. And that means if we can attribute it to something on the solar surface, uh, then we know it's coming our way. And the coronagraph gives us a lead time of, you know, it can be as little as 18 hours for very fast ones to two or three days, maybe four days for the slower ones. This one got here in about two days. Okay. And so, uh, initially, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that's so when we first see that, that's when we can put out a watch. We try and model it, figure out an arrival time and get the word out so that people are ready. Right. And um, which, you, yes, which I saw the watch a couple of days ago. And um, but I was reading in the discussion, um, this uh, this appears to be much stronger than first originally forecast. And, and that's OK. Space weather prediction, from my understanding, having worked at NOAA back in uh, from 2009 to 20. Up to 2012, we, um, you know, we're just starting to see still the infancy of space weather prediction. Could you just give us a, a brief uh, history as to how that developed? And of course, we briefly talked about the impacts to communication systems and why it's important that you guys exist. Okay. Well, yeah, you can, uh, you can trace the history really back to the 40s uh, during World War II. Um, there was a lot of interest in propagation through the ionosphere. And so, we had our beginnings uh, with ionospheric propagation forecasts so that folks could communicate around the globe. Um, over time, we entered the space age and with the space age, uh, what was then, um, well, it had a lot of different names, but at one point it was the Space Disturbance Center, but uh, we began supporting the uh, Mercury and Gemini missions all the way through Apollo, and all the way through uh, where we are today with Artemis. Um, there are a variety of customers and those customers have grown over the years. So we've got lots of different people involved, including the grid, um, satellite operators, uh, radio operators, emergency managers, there's a whole, a whole slew of uh, folks who are interested in what we do and uh, want to receive those products. And so our job is to uh, stay vigilant 24 seven uh, around the year, just like the regular weather forecast office, except we do space. And uh, it's still challenging. You're absolutely right about being in the infancy of uh, space weather forecasting, but it's been, it's been just fantastic to watch where we were when I started here in 2007 to where we are now. We had about three models when I got here. We have 16 now. Um, our, uh, error bar on either side of the arrival of these uh, storms was about 24 hours, and we've got that down to seven when it's really good. Now, sometimes, like this time, it you know got here a little early, and that happens. So, but we're constantly working on improving, and we've got a lot of support from across the board, from industry and academia, and uh, the government. So it's been it's been pretty spectacular to watch. Yeah, and also corresponding with that 11 year cycle too, as we've seen the frequency of these, you know, um, you know, coronal mass eject ejections, you know, increasing, you know, naturally occurring um, with the technology and stuff, everything's just kind of blossomed, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. And so it's a, it's a constant um, exercise to uh, try and stay away or stay ahead of the space weather and find ways, you know, as much as we can, as a society, we find ways to engineer around it. But there are some things, you know, that are still out there that that still have impacts. And, and that's why we're here. And we'll briefly touching on impacts one more time. Uh, nothing really gets burned up in terms of like these things aren't strong enough to like completely send a 
uh, a satellite system or telecommunication system off of its course and come crashing down to Earth? Uh, when we have geomagnetic storms, uh, the atmosphere uh, can expand. And for satellites in low Earth orbit, that can cause increased drag. And so those increased drag events uh, cause the satellites to uh, move out of their expected orbit. And in extreme cases, uh, you know, spacecraft can come down. We had an example a while back where uh, SpaceX lost some of their Starlink satellites uh, in, an, in an environment where the uh, atmosphere had become swollen and more dense. So it is possible, but generally, um, again, we try and let folks know with enough time to take the precautions necessary to keep things running like they should. Sure. All right, so um, Robert, one more time, just give us kind of a, a synopsis, if you could focus on Alaska to the best of your knowledge, uh, what we can expect. So the concern that we're getting for, from some of our um, uh, some of our viewers and uh, comments and stuff is that, okay, we have 15 and a half hours of daylight tonight, you know, sun setting, um, you know, close to 10 o'clock. Uh, will there be enough light to diminish, you know, or even not see uh, what could very well be a strong display of aurora activity tonight? Uh, well, that, you know, it's, it's definitely less than optimum, um, but uh, if you've got you know, when you get to a point of decent darkness and uh, a lack of cloud cover, like you mentioned earlier, um, I think there's still pretty good chance. Um, we're, the solar wind right now is still uh, indicating uh, the opportunity for severe storms to occur. Um, and I don't see right now any reason unless the uh, magnetic field changes uh, for that to be any different. So I think there's hope, I think there's hope it may be, you know, it may be later um, than what we'd experienced down here in the CONUS, but uh, I think there's an opportunity. All right, um, and real quickly, um, in, in exciting levels, you know, situations like this at, at these high level uh, intense storms, um, what does your staffing ramp up to? I can hear a lot of noise and you're even in a different room than where the core functionality is occurring right now. What's, what, what, what uh, how, how, what does staffing beep up to? In a situation oh, like well, this. in uh, today, uh, when we saw that the uh, CME had arrived at Earth, um, we went, we plussed up from two forecasters that we normally have on duty to, uh, well, we brought four other individuals in. Um, and actually, another forecaster reported early, so that added a fist. So it was, a, it was um, yeah, we had quite a few people here. And that's, that's typical for these kind of events because we have a lot of different notifications that we have to do, including to the grid and to FEMA and media interviews like this. So there's a lot to do and uh, it takes a lot of people to get it done. So it's similar if you think about a, uh, you know, staffing up during a hurricane or a tornado. This is our version of that. All right, Robert uh, Steenberg, thank you so much for your time on what is a very busy Sunday evening for you. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Alaskans, uh, whether we're residents or many people, you know, travel up here to see the Aurora. It's nice to be able to get kind of a late season show, if you will, by Mother Nature. And hopefully there's no big impacts to uh, any kind of, uh, I would say, you know, hour by hour um, inconvenience to technology <laughs> tonight. So. All right. Well, it was my right. pleasure. And uh, like right. I said, we're, we're here around the clock for this. So uh, we're living the dream here. <laughs> Good to know that somebody's always on duty, right? So yeah, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, one more time, Mr. Robert Steenberg, Space Weather uh, Prediction Center Forecast Office Lead. Thank you so much for joining us here on Skywatch Alaska. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure.